Good morning. Good morning. Cory? Hello? Yes. You're in charge. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, everyone else can hear you also. Okay. Um, hello. Good morning from Manila. It's evening here. And uh, we welcome you to uh, our appreciative inquiry webinar. <laughs> I would like to request Brother Louis Bush. Are you there? He's not here yet. To open in prayer if he's there. Hmm? Okay. Um, it seems Brother Luis is not there yet. No. Let me open then in prayer. Father, we are so privileged and we're so grateful for this wonderful opportunity that we can come together and learn about a new way of looking at uh, communities and organizations in ourselves. Lord, we pray for your Holy Spirit to guide and direct our conversations. I pray for our brother Raju as he facilitates this discussion. Help us, Lord, to listen, to dialogue, and to interface, interact wisely. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me introduce uh, our brother Raju Mandhyan. He is an Indian business entrepreneur and an expert in um, organizational development. Raju and I met about five years ago when he was president of the Association of Appreciative Inquiry in the Philippines. He um, is a coach, a trainer, and an author. He has written uh, several books, and um, we are so privileged that he graciously uh, shares with us his uh, books and his time. So Raju, thank you so much for um, being a resource person for us at this time. How many are we now in the Raju? How many? We are, are we? sixteen so far, and we have to okay. wait for maybe fifty have signed up. So uh, let's give them some time. Okay. Uh, we can't hear everyone, but if uh, somebody wants to say something, all they have to do is raise a hand and. I'll click that person so that unmute that person. I'll try and unmute that person. Nestor. Hi, Nestor. Nestor, go ahead. Mr. Romero, Nestor, go ahead, please. Hello, Patrick. Hello. Yeah, good morning, Patrick. Good afternoon from Uganda. Right. Hey. It's a bit choppy. I'm very good. It's a bit choppy. Very strong. My submissions. I'll text second. Uh, I think uh, Patrick, your uh, internet connection is slightly weak. That's why it's choppy. Or maybe it's uh, our side, I don't know. The network's not so good, so we can't hear you. Concrete in the building, um, out of this building. Hmm. Not too clear. Uh, maybe okay. you want to, yeah. Yeah. Maybe you want to type in your in the chat box or in the question box, and I'll read it. Hello. 
you hear me? Hi, Ryu. Is this uh, uh, yes, please? Nestor? Nestor. Yes. Yes. Hi, Ryu. Well, I am we can hear my wife. And we can hear you nice and clear. We can hear you nice and clear. Okay. Okay. I I am Nestor. I am from Colombia. Um, we are here in this moment in Miami, in Florida, in states, and I am with my, my wife, who belong belong to to our ministry. Very good. Welcome. His her name is her name is Sandra. All right. Welcome, Sandra. Okay. Uh, I think. Hi, are you? How are you? Hola, good morning. Well, uh, welcome. Seems like Luis is still not here. Uh, we are on time. Patrick still has his hand raised. Uh, he said hello and Nestor said hello. I think the rest are just waiting. So, uh, Corey, with your permission, I can get started. Corey, with your permission, can I get started? Yeah. yeah right. Let's get started. Okay, there's 19 now. So, Corey, I'll be able to hear you on and off. Uh, just so that my voice reaches to everyone, I'll try and uh, mute some people once in a while. I'll keep you on, though. Let's see how it goes, because you are in the same neighborhood. So, Patrick and Nestor, I'll have to mute you for a minute, if that's okay. All right, good morning. So uh, welcome to this uh, webinar and we'll be here uh, 60 to 90 minutes, depending on how it goes. And if you have questions, just punch them in and I'll read them out or invite you to speak up. Okay? Yes, I'm, I'm in the webinar. Right. Okay. Now, uh, <coughs> opportunity of inquiry, uh, Founded, designed, created. Uh, yeah. The original thesis paper was written by Dr. David Cooper right uh, more than 25 years ago, and since then it it is a tool, a toolbox, a technology that lots of people in the organizational development, in the coaching, in the facilitation industry use. Uh, the reason so many people use it freely and abundantly is number one, of course that Dr. Cooper Ryder made this free for everyone. So there is no copyright and there's no ownership except that we recognize his work. And uh, so that's about the history of appreciative inquiry. And what is it essentially? I'll flip to the next screen. Uh, it's a little disclaimer. It'll take a while until it comes on your screens. There, it did. So I'll skip reading that. And here's the agenda. The next screen is an agenda. Again, uh, I may probably jump back and forth as your questions go or as I see the engagement level here on my screen. Essentially, I'll try and explain what the essence of appreciative inquiry is. We'll cover a few principles, maybe share a story. And one of the most crucial elements of this method, or as we chose to call it, a way of life, is the fact that it asks questions. That is the biggest thing in this approach, is that it inquires it uh, raises questions rather than telling people what to do. And that's really a powerful approach. And as I get into it, because questions are used by coaches, by counselors, and extremely good teachers also use questions rather than just make statements. So 
we'll cover that portion in depth as we come to the screens. So uh, that's a quick introduction and right now we are 20 people out of the 50. And should anyone have a raised hand? Let's see, anybody raise the hand here? Colonel Schneider has, Cor Schneider has raised the hand here. I'm going to let him speak for a minute and see if we can hear him well. So here we go. Cor Schneider has a raised hand. There you go. Uh, you okay, Cor Schneider, it was, it was yes, just sir. a mistake that the hand was risen, so I'll put it out. So oh, okay, just all right. Continue. Steve. All right. Okay. Good. So while you're there, uh, uh, while you're there, and everyone can hear you, may I ask you a question? Where? What's your location as of now, Paul Schneider? My location at this moment it is in uh, in the Netherlands. So we are working uh, Europe, okay. Africa to exchange. Okay. Is my voice clear? Huh? Yeah. Is my voice clear at where you are? Yes, we are in the Netherlands, so no. we are building bridges Europe, Africa. So we work a lot in the African continent and in Europe. Europe is, is more the urban areas and in Africa is more the rural areas. Do you, do you hear me well? I hear you very well. Oh, thank God. Oh, God. That's, that was a major concern because feedback is very difficult. Very, very, very clear. God bless. God bless. That's a, that's a blessing. All right. Very good. So I hope most everyone does. And uh, if you raise a question, if you can't hear me, raise a raise a hand, and I'll uh, I'll invite you in. I see a raised hand. No. Okay. All right. So uh, let's see how many people we can put in. So there we go. That was the introduction to how appreciative inquiry came about. Now. Uh, let me move on to the next screen here on the presentation. You see two kids. Yes, you do. Now, uh, this is a little story which kind of puts across the value of appreciative inquiry very quickly. And if I tell you this story, uh, I'll be able to work around the definition, the meaning, the value, and the applications of appreciative inquiry after I go through this little incident from the book called Primal Leader by Daniel Goldman, which was published nearly 15 years ago. In this book, uh, Daniel Goldman talks about a case study where a mother somewhere in the world, maybe uh, in the USA, gives birth to twins and for tonight's sake let's call them Noah and Nolan she gives birth to these two twins when these two twins when these twins are presented to her they are placed in her presence and she regards them as she beholds them uh, a thought crosses her mind the thought that cro crosses her mind is that hey uh, of these twins one of them looks like me. Therefore, the one who looks like me in appearances must be like me. That's what goes through her mind when she beholds one of her own children. When she looks at the other child and she glances, the thought that goes through her mind is that this other child of mine, this other baby, looks a little bit like my husband. Therefore, he must be like my husband. That's the thought that goes through her mind. Now, uh, I don't want to expand uh, what kind of opinion she held about herself or about her husband. But as the children began to grow and as she nurtured them and cared, them, cared for them as a mother would, every now and then, whenever she glanced at Nolan, the thought that ran through her mind is that this child is like me. And whenever she glanced at Noah, this child is like my husband. 
Well, the children went to the same school. They bought same clothes. They got the same toys. They lived in the same neighborhood, in the same environment. Probably had same friends, but every now and then, whenever the mother glanced at Noha, this little thought went through her mind, this boy is like my husband. And probably a frown would appear on her face whenever she spoke to Noha. And when she spoke to Nolan, uh, there was probably a gentle smile thinking that this child is like me. Well, years went by. The researchers who uh, uh, followed this case years later, nearly 25 years later, again went back to find out how these two boys, who were now men, were doing. Well, they realized that the one, the first one, who the mother regarded to be like her, was pretty successful in life. He had a good attitude. Uh, he was pretty friendly. His levels of self-confidence, his self-esteem was about par. He did good in school, did great in sports, met the right people, had, had the correct relationships, and went on to be a productive citizen of the country. On the other hand, the second child, Noah, well, they were not first or second, they were twins, uh, went through a troubled childhood, had a hard time in school, uh, was low on self-esteem, would, would probably do things that was not, were not expected of him. And when he grew up to be a grown-up adult citizen of the world, he wasn't productive, he was in trouble, he went in and out of relationships, went in and out of situations which were not happy uh, to say. So uh, that, that is a case study in the book. And the message that this case study puts across is that regardless of the environment, regardless of the schooling, regardless of the clothing, regardless of the food, food and whatever training they got, it was the mother's opinion of the child that created them such. That is the conclusion that they came to. Now, uh, again, this is an extreme case. It's a case study. And... Uh, of course, in the development and the formation of a human being, a lot goes in. But just to understand uh, what Appreciative Inquiry is all about, how you behold people at your first glance and how you speak to them or how you treat them, it's not what you do on the surface, but what thoughts you hold, the assumptions that you hold within yourself while relating to people have a larger impact on them. So, uh, yeah, that is the correct st statement. That means it's, the subjective impact is larger than the visible on the surface interaction. So, uh, I'd like to pause here and see if there are any raised hands and answer those questions if there are questions. If not, then I'd like you to bring, I'd like to take you forward into the assumptions that the theory or the approach of appreciative inquiry has. Hello. Hello. Yes, uh, so Corey? No, I'm just trying to see if there's anyone who has a oh. question. Or Oh, uh, well, here are hands up. I want to see if there are hands up. Is there any hands? Uh, of course, Naidu. Uh, did that come across clearly? Sorry. It's down now. Hmm? Oh, Nestor. Hi, Nestor. Uh, how are you? Yeah. Uh, we don't have any questions. 
Okay, good. Uh, Thor? No, I had also no questions. Just the hand was not clear. But it was <laughs> that's okay. That's all right. So, uh, that's the story. Keeping that story in mind, let me introduce our precision of inquiry. It's what, what it's called, an emerging paradigm for seeking what works and moving towards it. An OD method, or better still, a way of life, which we covered. Uh, I'll jump a few screens forward, and then I'll come back to this. I'm jumping a few screens, and here I am at the assumptions that the theory or the method of appreciative inquiry makes. Now, uh, in the whole theory, when the rest of the world talks about appreciative inquiry, there are eight assumptions. For tonight, uh, I'm going to just cover five assumptions. Because the other three uh, are quite similar to some of these five. So, assumption number one. Some people call it the guiding principle number one. Guiding principle. Assumption. Let me just uh, manage this. Hang on, please. There's some sounds there. Yeah, so assumption number one is in every human situation there is something that always works. Uh, when we talk about human situation, it could be an individual, a group, or an organization. When, uh, the, uh, the first assumption is that no matter how it appears, no matter how they look, no matter what their outcome or performance has been, so far, there is always something that works. There is always something that is functional. There is always something that is beautiful. There is always something that is productive within them. Uh, Corey and I talk about this once in a while. And we, in, in the Philippines, there is a value called kapwa. Uh, kapwa means, that means when we behold someone else, we see a reflection of ourselves in them. And the last time we had this conversation, the, the statement that came up is that we are all created in his image. Therefore, there is something powerful in each one of us. So, that is assumption number one. In every human, in the, uh, uh, human being, in every human system, in every organization, there must be something that works, there must be something that, there, that is good, there must be something that is functional, and that something needs to be reached in, found, and brought forth, brought out, expanded, enhanced, nurtured, and made bigger and stronger. So that is the first assumption in this approach to appreciative inquiry. How is that? Assumption number two, what we focus upon becomes our reality. Going back to the story of the mother and her twins, well, the first thought, the first little sliver of a thought that went through her mind was that the twins are different. And even though she did not intend to uh, create harm, let's say, even though she did not create, intend to let them grow up differently, but yet in her mind, a, 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 a mist, a thought, a fine shadow of a thought, every time it passed by, it became real for the child who did not succeed in life. Thus, it might not have been a deliberate focus on her part, yet it was there, a subjective focus. A uh, shadow of a focus was on the fact that this child is not like me, and he may be challenged. And eventually that became a reality for that child. Because in her words, in her expressions, in her gestures, in in the tonality of her voice, she probably put across that 
thing that she wa thought was true of him. So, uh, well, it happens to all of us, you know. Uh, sometimes we focus on success, and we do. Sometimes if we fear failure, fear is also a focus. We fail at things. So handling people, dealing with people, uh, working with others, when we come through fear, when we come from fear of uh, doing harm or uh, not succeeding at any endeavor, we happen to fail. Thus making a mental and emotional or spiritual effort to succeed or to wish good or do good will change that for us, will change the outcome for us. So that is assumption two. What we focus upon becomes our reality. I hope I'm going at the proper speed for everyone. I know some of you are far and because of the internet maybe there's a slight delay in uh, in, in uh, my voice being heard or the screens moving from one to another. Kor has his hand up. Kor, uh, do you need to ask me a question? Or do you want to put your hand down? Yes, I... Uh, I'll put it no, down. No, just uh, a question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes? Um, yes, sir. Let's say when you say what we focus on becomes our reality, it almost yes. seems like self-fulfilling prophecy but also what you think you can do, if you can think it, you can do it. How far is this going? Because you have, besides to do with your own realities, with the real reality. Uh, a, a week ago, James sent me a video clip of a doctor called California Leaf, and she said, uh, these are things, our focus works in, on our neurosystem, but yes, it works with the blessing of the Lord. Thus, that means uh, we are not talking about ultimate reality. We are talking about objective, present reality. So, working with that and succeeding with our efforts, our endeavors, and people. So, okay. uh, yeah. All right. Great. Thank you. Good. So, uh, actually, we'll send you uh, all the conversation that has occurred in the past. We'll send you those links and we'll also send you a recording of this. Yes, uh, Mr. Romero, you have a question. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I think that is a matter of truth or lies that you have in your mind. What do you think about that? Uh, well, uh, Corey, Cor, you want to answer that? No, what did, I didn't get it. I didn't get uh, the question. No, no. Uh, uh, Mr. Romero's question was, is it a matter of truth or lies that exist in your head? Uh, well, uh, uh, it, it's just a focus. It, it's what you think you might create. So, uh, I, 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 I can't make an assessment on what can be true or a lie, but what you will focus upon, uh, let's call it failure or success, in human relationships or in developing others. Let's just call it that, Mr. Romero. Instead of calling it the truth or a lie because uh, that could be an opinion. What I'm saying here is what you focus upon succeeding with an organization, with a group, with a community, when you focus upon that will work. When you focus upon building an individual wholeheartedly, then that can be achieved. Um, can I just say something? Yes. Um, yeah. I think it's a verse in Hebrews where um, we are asked to focus our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. I think the shame. It's like the also the scriptural injunction, you know, to focus your eyes on God, because when we f focus our eyes on something we tend to become and we tend to appropriate the qualities of that person or that something that we focus our eyes on. The vision. So, yeah, so to Maybe. me that's like the principle of focusing. We tend to appropriate the and uh, imbibe the qualities, characteristics of uh, people that uh, 
we uh, focus on. And I think that's why the scriptural principle of focusing our eyes on Jesus is very important because if we focus our eyes on him, then we become like him. Right. Okay. Uh, let me progress, Mr. Romero. Mr. Romero? Yes, yes. Okay, let me progress to the next two, three uh, assumptions. And then we'll still have time in the end to have a all-around conversation. Three, uh, reality is created in the moment and there are multiple realities. And Corey and I just spoke about it a few hours ago. Uh, in, uh, this is, of course, an assumption laid out by Dr. Cooper Ryder, no? and we, we, we actually had a little discussion on the language. What this means is perspective is created in the moment, and there are multiple perspectives. Thus, uh, if there is a challenge at hand, let's say the challenge of poverty. Uh, well, again, in the in, in assumption, uh, appreciative inquiry, be careful on uh, labeling anything. So when I label someone as something as poverty, that could become my focus. But let's say we assume that we have a challenge with the community's growth or there is a, 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 a hurdle in our path. You know? And at the first glance, we think that it's going to be tough. It's going to be hard at the first glance. At the second glance, at the third glance, when we get closer, when we, when we view the challenge from all directions, we realize that, hey, it's probably not as tough or challenging as I first thought it would be, as I first assumed it might be. So in a matter of moments, after changing your perspective, after changing your view of the obstruction in the path, your view changed from one minute to another. It went from tough, challenging, to it moved to possible. It moved to, yes, it can be done. No? So uh, that is the first uh, insight into this assumption. The second assumption is that there may be several people standing around the challenge, surrounding the challenge, around the obstruction or hurdle in our path. Now each one of us will have a different view. Some might say tough but possible. Some might say tough but not today. Some might say possible with a few more resources. So each one of us will have a different perspective every time. Thus, this says that as the world moves, as we progress and move towards what we want to create with the assumption that what we want to create is good, whatever lays in our path can change form depending on how we look at it, how our perspectives change. And they do change fast. They do change rapidly. No? So reality is created in the moment, at this given moment, and there are multiple realities. For example, uh, this discussion of appreciative inquiry. 30 minutes ago, it was new to us. Uh, now 20 minutes into it, 30 minutes into it, uh, our view of this approach is changing. I, I, I can't tell you whether it's changing for the good or not for the good, but it is changing. That is the truth. Or oh, that is the reality of, as of this moment. So that's the third uh, assumption. The fourth one, the language we use shapes our reality. And uh, this is also very powerful in uh, appreciative inquiry because the language in appreciative inquiry is a language of forgiveness, of kindness, of compassion. In fact, every single word that we use in our conversations, in our dialogue with our recipients of our support of our work, we choose that those dialogues, choose those words. Uh, in the case of the mother, for example, I'm not saying that she used the wrong language, but her nonverbal language had an impact on the child. Thus, 
even even a single letter of your word can create harm. A, a, a little humorous story that goes through my mind is the story of Roosevelt Jr. and Roosevelt Sr. It's a little fable from the books. It talks about this father who used to uh, hand, who used to let his son do some odd jobs every weekend. And uh, sometimes he'd ask his little son, a 10-year-old boy, to go cut the grass, to chop the wood, uh, to fetch water, etc., etc. And one fine day, this father, Senior Roosevelt, hands his son a bunch of nails and a hammer, and he says, son, I want you to go, and I want you to hammer these nails into the oak tree in our backyard. So the little boy picks up the nails and the hammer and runs into the backyard, and that's his assignment for the day. He goes and hammers those nails inside into the oak tree. Comes back to the dad and he says, Dad, I'm done. And dad says, good boy, go have fun. A week later, the boy comes back and says, Dad, what's my assignment this weekend? What do I have to do? So dad says, okay, here's the hammer now that you used last week. Take the hammer, use the other end of the hammer, go back into that oak tree and pull the nails out, the ones that you hammered a week ago. So the boy does that. And he goes and pulls out the ham, uh, nails one by one, brings them back to daddy and says, Daddy, here are the nails. And dad says, good boy. And the little boy runs off to play. But after he runs off to play, he wonders, what was that whole exercise all about? Last week, dad asked me to hammer nails. This week, he asked me to pull them out. So he goes back to his father and he says, Dad, uh, I need to understand. You gave me two assignments and I, see, I saw no purpose in those assignments, hammer the nails in and pull them out. Dad says, go back to the old tree, son, and see if the nails that you hammered in and pulled out have left a scar. So the boy goes back and of course the tree is full of nail holes, scars, which couldn't be filled. So uh, the message, the point is that every time we use words, we can't draw them back. Uh, and the words we use can create harm or create healing. Thus, becoming extremely careful, extremely selective and choosy about the words we use, how we morph them, how we put them together, and of course, how we express them is really, really important in our developmental work. That's four. And, uh, I hope I'm going good. Is there a question? Is there a hand raised up? None. None. So uh, let's come to the last assumption, the fifth one. And uh, this is actually the, not just an assumption, but it is also the toolbox behind, uh, behind the functionality of appreciative inquiry. This is what really makes appreciative inquiry work uh, so powerfully in building communities and creating change and helping people uh, become better than who they were yesterday, helping people achieve what they want to achieve in their lives. So uh, this one is the act of asking questions influences the outcome in some way. And uh, I'd like to spend a little time on discussing this last assumption, and I'll take it straight into the toolbox, the protocol, which is known. And I'm just wondering if Corey wants to uh, add in a few words at this time before I go into the protocol. Corey? I just want to, to comment on the power of the word. You know, as a Christians, we know that the Word of God created the world. The, God cr created the world into existence by the power of His Word. So um, I think that's one of the biblical uh, affirmation of that principle, that whatever we say is very powerful and that, um, you know, God is so powerful that by just uttering his words, he created the world. 
Okay. Uh, would anybody else want to add something or ask a question? Uh, just just uh, click the hand there uh, next to your name and I'll have to unmute you. None so far, none so far. Did anything go up? Oh, there's Nestor. Hi, Nestor. Uh, Hello, Nestor. I heard you. My, my question, my, yes, my question is uh, that the, the, the fifth assumptions means that it's very important to take care about the questions that you, you that you use in order to improve the performance of some human being yes yes uh, uh, Nestor uh, I, I still haven't discussed in depth the value and the strength of asking questions but yes that's exactly what it means and, and in the next few minutes I'll really tell you how questions work and how powerful they are in creating and driving change and it's it's really massive uh, and I hope that in the next 30 minutes or 40 minutes that's left for us to talk this that I can put this across well and uh, uh, not only put this across well but hand it to you so that when you have conversations with your communities instead of us telling people what to do uh, we evoke their strengths that means we help them discover uh, the spirit and the power that is within them, the good that is already within them. That means, isn't it nice that people figure out that they can rather than we tell them that they can? So that's the essence of uh, this last assumption. The act of asking questions influences the outcome in not some way, but in every single way. That is my opinion that in every single way when you ask someone a question, they offer you something valuable. So uh, if that's okay, uh, I'd like to go ahead into this uh, fifth assumption and its application in the protocol. So I'm going to jump a few slides, but I'll come back to them. Uh, let's come back. One, two, three, four. Here it is. Inquiry the protocol. Uh, do you see this screen? inquiry the AI protocol yes. it's all about questions and uh, so I'll spend a little time in fact uh, I'm gonna unmute several people at random and if you wanna just jump in and add a word it, this is the time that this little webinar becomes a lot more interactive and I hope this technology that I'm using can support it so I'm going to unmute people at random, but if you keep your hands raised, it'll be very good. So, uh, raised will be very good. Right, sorry. Okay, Nestor's hand is up, but I'm going to, uh, 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 Farshid, there you go, Farshid is unmuted. Random, I don't know who. Uh, Harry, random. And um, Mr. James is here too, so I'll just unmute him. There we go. Uh, there you go. So here's here, here's the thing on questions. It's Patrick, okay, and uh, Rio from Indonesia. Let's see how many people I can really. Uh, oops, 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 oops. What is that? Oh, something's wrong. Wait, something went wrong. This Corey. Corey is right here. Okay, Corey, can you hear me? I had to mute yes. people because there was a lot of disturbance suddenly. Anyway, no raised hands, no raised hands, no raised hands. Corey is okay. Corey, you can still hear me, right? Okay. Yes. yes. Okay, uh, Harry's hand is raised up. There you go. I clicked Harry open and there's no other. Okay. Now, uh, inquiry the AI protocol the power of asking questions. So let me ask you people, uh, whenever we are asked a question, what happens to us? What happens to an individual when we ask them a question? Well, since I can't hear it, I think they delve into their own 
memory banks, they delve into their own thinking, they delve into their own value systems, and they want to offer, they feel like offering an answer. That is the power of dialogue, that is the power of conversation. Ask a question and people feel like making a valuable offer. People uh, wish to make a valuable offer. Once they wish to make a valuable offer, valuable offer, uh, they look for the right answer within their own, from their own experience, from their own uh, memory banks, from their own knowledge, from their own wisdom. They want to offer something to co-create something good. So that's the first step. What happens? Post responding to questions. That means I ask a question and you give me an answer. The answer that you gave me, the answer that you offer to the conference or to the discussion or to the dialogue, uh, you have a certain relationship with that answer. You have a sense of responsibility and a sense of ownership towards that answer. That, hey, I said this and this was my offering to the conversation. That's level two. The first level is you wish to, you want to, you want to make an offer. The second one is once you make an offer, of course, using uh, proper language, the proper assumptions, you make an offer. You have a sense of ownership to that. Uh, so when we work with communities, once they make an offer, they have a sense of ownership to the proposals, to the ideas, to the thoughts that they offer that, hey, I said that and I will stand behind that. Or, at least I'll support it or I'll work for it. So that's the level two of asking questions. The third level is <coughs> that <coughs> once people have made that offer, once people stand behind that offer, it is very easy for us or them to move, to take action, to create, to build something out of that offer they have made. And that, that's, that's really powerful. It, really changes your position from trying to push to create something. You draw people out. You draw communities to come and offer and to perform and to, and to succeed and to build. That's the, uh, that's the essence of question. Three levels. Number one, we feel like offering. We want to offer. We want to co-create. Number two, we become responsible. We have a sense of ownership and we stand behind what we have offered. Well, it's, it's us. It came from where we stand. The third one is it becomes easy for us to take action in line with what we have offered, to stand behind and perform. And oh, well, people call it to become accountable. Yeah, to actionable, that's it. So there are questions and uh, these are pretty easy questions, the open question and the closed questions, you know. O open questions are more, more empowering, uh, unlike closed questions. But let's skip that. You can probably read that from the slides, no? There's an exercise here which says, rank the following from powerful to more powerful. Obviously, yes, no questions are least empowering. And the most empowering in this, uh, in this range of questions is the what if questions. Like, what if there was something better? What if there was something beautiful? What if we can together achieve what we are wanting to build? So uh, from ranking, the first one is the least empowering and the sixth one is the most empowering. Now, uh, the other thing about questions is that when we as leaders or change agents, when we ask questions, it is plain impossible not to uh, dilute that question from our own perceptions, from our own views, whatever they might be, uh, whatever our perception of that challenge that we spoke about might be. So it is, it is that's, that's, uh, that's nature. So uh, we have to be careful on how we also frame our questions. No? In, within the question itself, we must make all those positive assumptions or try and employ those guiding principles that we spoke about in the beginning. 
the principle of in every human system there is something that works, what we focus upon will become our reality and our language creates our worlds. And of course the act of asking questions uh, has an influence on the outcome. So uh, that's the power of questions and in the mode of appreciative inquiry, let me come back to this why. There are three kinds of questions, three categories of questions which uh, this whole approach proposes. The first kind, as you see on the screen, inward questions. Inward questions are questions that will help our audience, uh, our communities, our recipients in thinking back, in reflecting, in uh, discovering value from within us. That means making us think about why are we doing this? Why are we wanting to create what are we creating? Those kind of questions. Reflective, thus going back into the depths of our minds, into our own value systems to find out what is making us want to do what we want to build. Uh, the vision that we are creating, what is our purpose behind that. So it's about reflection. Way before uh, action, way before commitment, a lot of reflection uh, these questions drive. So questions like, what's important and why do we care? It's a positive question. It's, it's an appreciative question. It is not a question that will put anybody on the defense. What is the purpose behind our purpose? That means a deeper reflection. What constructive facts do we know? That means, what is it that is working for this system as of now? We talked about that in every human system there is something that works. So what constructive facts do we know? Do they have resources, physical? Do they have material resources? Do they have uh, talent resources? What can we employ to make things work? So those are inward questions. And uh, again, uh, that's the level one or category one questions. Or again, what precisely did we do right? It's like listing our strengths. It's saying that, hey, we did that right in the, la in the last attempt. Let's try it this time one more time and see if the same approach works. So thus, gathering strength, gathering value, gathering resources and reflecting deeply upon our past, Re deflect, reflecting deeply upon our purpose. So inward questions. Now inward questions usually evoke stories from our recipients. Why do they uh, evoke stories is when people reflect, they don't reflect in numbers or they don't reflect in just plain data, they reflect with emotions and spirituality then they offer you stories. And in those stories, you can see uh, what is good about them because it's very difficult for people to stand up and declare what their strengths are. Uh, I want to share a true story about this process which was employed by my son. My son's a Sunday school teacher and <coughs> he, did a he did a thesis in his final year of college there's a group, a community in the Philippines that lives by the streams and the rivers of the Philippines. And here's the, here's the language. They are considered pretty undeveloped, backward. And here's the language, which is wrong. I mean, that's not the right term for it. It's probably politically wrong to call them backward, but they live by the streams and by the rivers. So my son and his group, who wanted to do a thesis on this, this community, they went to them. And they, instead of asking them questions and doing interviews and stuff like that, that, hey, what do you need, what your strengths are, what they did was they offered them cameras, free cameras, one of those old-fashioned uh, cameras with film. And they said, hey, go shoot pictures about your life, about the stories in your life, and we'll process them for you, and then if you want to talk about them, fine. So they gave half a dozen cameras to this group of people and these people who are like uh, the, the ethnic Filipinos by the rivers, they took pictures and a week later my son and his friends went back, they took the pictures, processed them, went back again to this community 
And when these people began to look at the pictures of their life, they began to tell stories about what their dreams were, or what their hopes were, or what caused happiness to them, or uh, how closely related they were and where their strengths lay as a community. Regardless of what an outside observer saw, there was a lot of strength in that community. So uh, my son and his group, without having really a verbal conversation, had a conversation in images. And they did this for several weeks. And post that, they wrote a thesis about that, which was a very successful one. So the purpose of inward questions is the same. It is having people speak up, having people share their own strengths and stories. That's the first uh, category of questions. The second one, the second level of questioning. Uh, Harry, would you have a question? You have a hand raised? He's offline. Okay, uh, Nestor, do you have a question? Anna and nobody else. No, no, sir, no, sir. No, no question, no question, thank you. All right, Corey, do you want to add something there? No. No. No, Corey? No. Okay. Can you hear me well? Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, level two is outward questions for connecting insights to ideas. Uh, outward questions are about physical resources, material resources, possibilities. Uh, they are about the stories that we have heard and converting them to workable ideas that, hey, these are our strengths, these are our possibilities, and these were our success in the past. What can we do with them today? What can we add? What do we have in the environment that we live, in the economy that supports us? What can we use? So these are questions such as, uh, how can we best transfer information? How can we best help a community? What are the steps that we need to take? You know? Or how can we share this learning to a larger community? So these are actually physical action uh, steps that these questions draw, outward questions. You know? And the third category of questioning is forward questioning. Now, forward questioning goes back and connects itself to what we focus upon becomes our reality. That means whatever we visualize out into the future for us, uh, whatever is beautiful in the future, whatever that draws us, it's a question about clarifying that vision. Uh, it's about letting people see themselves in that surrounding and having them describe that saying, how will you feel when things that, the things that we are planning to change will change? How will we feel when we arrive to that destination that we've been dreaming of? No? So uh, thus, it's a description of a dream, a future, something in, uh, something miles and days ahead beyond our work. So when people describe that, it empowers them, it energizes them that, hey, it's possible. In fact, not only is it possible, but I see it being achieved. So these are the three categories of questions, inward, outward, and forward. They don't need to be used uh, in the sequence of inward, outward, and forward, but they need to be felt. We need to use them very sensitively and depending on uh, who we are talking to at what stage our relationship is or at what state their uh, mindset is or what, what kind of uh, ambience that surrounds them. So very sensitively, very carefully, we need to work through these questions so that we can create a vision of the future and empower them to take action. So uh, three levels of questioning with five assumptions. A uh, little insight on questions. Questions must always be in the direction of a solution, of evoking creativity, of holistic growth. 
never in the direction of an error or a blame or a question that draws out defensiveness from our recipients. Many times people ask the question, why? <clears throat> why is a great question in many ways, but many times it's, it rubs people the wrong way because uh, ego kicks in. People go into defending their position rather than offering solutions. So all questions must be such that they move us ahead, they empower us, they uh, uh, brighten the vision that we hold together and in the direction of co-creation. So three levels of questioning. Yeah. Uh, at this stage, of course, uh, in a real interaction in a workshop, we try questioning to find out what kind of questions we are asking. But since uh, we're challenged through being on a webinar, maybe we can't do that. But if you have questions at this stage about uh, the process of questioning about the protocol, let's take them. Let's uh, bounce back a few questions back and forth. So anyone raises a hand or I can, again, uh, unmute a few people at random because if I unmute a lot of people, it becomes, there's a disturbance. Anyone? Cody, would you like to add anything to those uh, process of questioning? Well, <clears throat> I think uh, that relates later to the the 4D. Yes, absolutely. It ties. Um, with, it's like there is the process in which we uh, have the 4D. Yeah. And the different kinds of question relates to the process. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It does. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. So I'll move ahead, and if I see a raised hand, I'll I'll unmute that. So here's the. I four. just want to add. Yes, yes, you? yes, Corey. Yeah. I just want to add that. I just want to add that um, when we look at the Gospels. Yeah. And the way that, and the way that Jesus taught. Yeah. He was using you know, question as a method of teaching and uh, provoking or evoking people's uh, ideas. He was asking questions that were either evocative, provocative, or, you know. So Jesus, if you look at the Gospels, was doing a lot of different kinds of these uh, inward, outward, and forward questions. I, I think a combination of uh, questions and storytelling, Corey, Stories, yes. Jesus was a good storyteller. Yeah, it's, uh, because the questions evoke stories from people. And uh, though we are not discussing the process of storytelling today in this webinar, but it's a large part of uh, the appreciative inquiry process, storytelling. Uh, we should take up a lot more on how to go about it, but questions evoke stories. And uh, mm. we nurture stories, we support them, and we help the stories grow, not because of the entertainment value, but rather than of understanding the message, understanding the value behind uh, what we stand for, what we are creating, and what we are trying to build. So uh, questions like loosen up stories, and lots of stories happen in the process of appreciative Okay, so uh, step two. So all those assumptions that we spoke about, the five, and the protocol and the process of questioning and constantly questioning and happily questioning and throwing questions lightly, randomly, carefully, so that people uh, become stronger, become uh, offer things rather than being uh, scared moved away from things. No? Now, there's a framework, and the framework is totally dependent on the assumptions <coughs> and the process of inquiry. The framework is first uh, choosing a positive core. That means, what is it that we want to change? What is it that deep within us we want to bring about? That's a positive core. 
You know? Sometimes people talk about, uh, we spoke about this, reducing poverty. Well, let's, let's say that is our theme, reducing poverty. In its essence, when we say reducing poverty, we are recognizing and accepting the existence of poverty. And when we recognize and accept the existence of poverty, it can grow because, hey, it's on top of our mind, poverty. Yet, if you change the language of that framework, that little theme, that core, from reducing poverty, we go change the language, the words, into increasing affluence. Essentially, it may mean the same thing. But the power behind the word of increasing influence, it projects us into the future, into a future of possibility, and a future where we can move towards it, instead of having to be afraid of what existed, poverty. So increasing affluence, changing that. So once we have that theme, whatever our theme might be, whatever that we want to create or change, we change it. First, label it correctly, okay? because the label will change everything inside it. So affirmative topic, choice. There are many examples. We'll go back to a slide where, which, which will show us examples of what World Vision did. So once we have that theme, one that, once we have that positive core statement, then we go into the first uh, step, the first uh, model of the 4D cycle, which is discovery what gives life. So here we have a community or a human system. What we need to discover is what gives it life because there is something that is life-giving. It is there. What gives it life? What gave it life in the past? And you use the process of questioning, inward questioning or outward questioning and forward questioning, just like the story of the Dumagas, the people who live by the rivers and the lakes of the Philippines and who are considered, uh, who, who need development according to the outside world. So when we go back and find out what, what gives them life, it was the fact that they were together. It was the fact that they had respect for each other. It was the fact that they had something what is known as the spirit of bayanihan, the spirit of togetherness, the spirit of kapwa, that means seeing myself in another. So that gave them life, regardless of the fact whether they had homes or material uh, needs in their life, it gave them life. So discovering what gave them life, appreciating what gives life to any system, to any community, to any group, discovering that. And this process can take anywhere from 30 minutes, an hour, to days until you have it. So when you have substantial amount of information on what gives life to that community that we behold, then we move on to step two now. So we know what gives them life, but what is it that they are wishing for? Uh, how beautiful can they become? Or what, what might they become if they can do what they wish to do? So it's dream state, no? Again here, I think the third category of questioning, and the uh, first and the third category of questioning, inward and forward, will evoke what this community or this group or the human system wants. You know? And listing it again, you know, keeping a track of, hey, what is it that we want? The third uh, step in the framework is the step of designing a process. Uh, in the corporate world, it's known as strategy. But in the world of appreciative inquiry, we call it a design. That means the process. How do we go about it? What is it that is within our means that we can do to reach that uh, vision, that image of a beautiful future that we together hold. And that's a step-by-step -step process. Hey, we can do this, or we can start promoting this, or we can start talking about that, or we can start education or building churches or schools like Corey and uh, to do in the Philippines. Now that is what they plan to do and that is what they're doing on a regular basis. That's a design. It's a step-by-step -step process. No? How to go about it ideally, co-constructing. And the fourth step is destiny. 
the destiny step is how to live, learn, and improve. It works under the assumption that the dream that we behold is possible. And if it's possible, we have the strength, we have the design. If it's possible, how do we see it? And once we reach that dream, how do we start living it? And when we are living it, what are the signs of life at that time? What are the signs of wonder and amazement in that state? So it's a little bit of uh, uh, projecting yourself or projecting the community in the future and making them see that vision. So that's the 4D cycle based on the three levels of questioning and based on the five assumptions that we discussed earlier. So uh, that essentially is to me what the process or the way of appreciative inquiry is all about. I can take you back to the slides and show you examples of what others have done, but this is a great moment to take questions and I'll open up almost everyone and see uh, who has something to offer or ask. Corey, uh, am I coming across clearly still? Yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, thank God. Okay. All right. All right. So, yeah, we have 23 people in attendance and anyone can just click the raised hand and I'll un mute it. Uh, I think I saw a hand. Right. Of course, Schneider is still open. Nestor is still open. Harry's, o Harry's not. James Butar is here. Maki Ishikawa. Okay. No questions. Anybody questions? Oh, Cole, there you go. Yes, I do. Yes, sir, Mrs. Um, Snyder. I just want to add, okay, I just want to add to what uh, Corey was saying about the biblical foundation also. I was just thinking there of uh, Ephesians 4, verse 29, where it stands, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that is may minister grace unto the hearers. And when I look at just in the simple Dutch translation, literally, it says that speak words that do good to the hearer. So it's not going about what we tell and what we think is right but that it must do good to the hearer. And that I see also so much in, uh, in this, this way of uh, appreciative inquiry. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, that's a supporting statement. And, and, yes, Corey. Yeah. Also, uh, Philippians 4, 6 to 8. Finally, my brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is pure, whatever is uh, you know, worthy of praise, Yep. Um, think of these things, and the peace of God will be with you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, in TW 2020, uh, I, I, I don't know, I did go through the flyers and I looked at the website and I see that there are some challenges that you uh, folks are going to attend uh, to, no? So uh, if there is any statement that you want to probably raise a question about that and work around the language, and we can do that in the next few minutes if you wish. I mean, uh, I wish uh, Rob Royd was here because he's a massive expert on appreciative inquiry, and he couldn't attend this morning. And he mentioned so, but uh, he's a great resource if he does attend. Uh, he is not attending from what I hear. But if there's anyone else, if there's something to be discussed, if not, uh, I will just, uh, these slides and this whole presentation will be made available to everyone and anyone, and you can look through it again. The, <coughs> the, the, the presentation is on SlideShare. I have sent the link to Luis and to Corey and to Anna, and she can send them all over back to you again. Uh, this conversation can be revisited as many times as we wish. 
So uh, if there being no questions or no offers, uh, we can call this to an end. Then, Corey, you can probably end with a prayer if that's okay. Okay. Shall we pray again? Um, Father, not destroy each other. I pray that our hearts and our minds would be filled with God's word, that we may learn to really be change agents. So we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everyone, and God bless you uh, in all, all the work you do, and thank you for being here. So, Corey, with permission, uh, yes. How many are we? Uh, we were 23. How many attended? 23 attended. We are now 21. I think a couple of people stepped out. Did Luis? Did Luis? Come? Luis, I, I don't think Luis turned up. I'm browsing through the names. I don't think Luis did turn up. And but Rio, uh, Mr. James, Mr. James Butar. Yeah, I'm here, Corey. Hi, Rio. <laughs> we, uh, Corey, I think we did. I think we need to follow up this conversation by Skype sometime uh, tonight or tomorrow if you have time. Okay. okay. Yeah, I think that we can. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have, a, I have appreciated this presentation. Thank you so much. Who is this? Who is that? Yeah. Uh, that this is James in Melbourne. Oh, hi, James. Oh, yeah, How are James. you? God bless you. Thank Very you for... well. <laughs> Thank you so much. This has been uh, so clear and uh, a big help. Uh, I like the I, I like the whole thing. I, I like 